A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. Welcome to A Mucky Business with me, Tim Farron. This is the show where we seek to look at the world of politics through a Christian lens. Is politics a mucky business? Well, yes, it is. But then again, so is everything else in this fallen world. And we want to help Christians to think wisely about politics and even to get involved and get their hands dirty. And we want to understand politics and politicians so that we can pray for our world, our country, the people who run them and for the people who would like to run them. This week, we're looking forward to Christmas and looking backwards over 2023. What a year it's been. It's hard to sum it up in one programme, but you know what? We're going to give it a try. I'm going to be joined by Cara Bentley as we seek to reflect on the year that was. Cara is a broadcast journalist and newsreader for Times Radio and, of course, my former co-host on this show. So no monologue from me this week, just, I hope, an illuminating conversation with a Christian friend who lives, breathes and, of course, reads the news about this mucky business. A Mucky Business with Tim Farron. So we're joined by Cara Bentley, previously of this parish. Cara, newsreader now and journalist for Times Radio Breakfast Show. Um, thanks for coming back. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm good. How are you? All right, really. And uh, delighted to, to see you again. And uh, we thought we'd perhaps have a, a run through, a kind of festive look back over some fairly serious issues and maybe one or two less serious issues over the last... 12 months as 2023 draws to a conclusion and this is our kind of final show of the year so from your perspective um sat in the newsroom dealing with all the stuff that comes in overnight for a breakfast show in particular how would you sum up 23 what's it been like being in the newsroom gosh it's probably similar to you in that you forget what was actually this year and what was another year and actually things that were this year feel like a lifetime ago because you've mm. covered so many things since then i think obviously One of the standout things has been the start of the war with Israel and Gaza. And I was on shift that Saturday when it started. And it started as just, oh, we've heard kind of rumours of through Reuters that militants have breached the border or something, maybe not that unusual. So it was kind of in the bulletin, but not top story for a couple of half hour bulletins. And then as we started to hear more, it was information was kind of trickling through. And we had a conversation in the office of, actually, I think this needs to be top story now. Mm. And then it was for, you know, solidly about three weeks at least. So that's probably obviously been the standout thing for news and a completely different type of news story to write because you have to be so careful how you write it and to cover yeah. everything and to be proportionate. Um, so a challenge as well. So obviously a lot of um, controversy surrounded the way the BBC reported, um, mm. not only, um, but the BBC reported those... Um, uh, those awful incidents on the 7th of October. And I think they opted for words like militant as opposed to terrorist. And I think that yeah. upset a number of people. Personally, I think they were wrong to make that choice of uh, of language. But you presumably sit down in the newsroom with a moment to decide because yeah. the news is breaking and you have to make those kinds of decisions about how to get the nuance right and the language right. How, how do those conversations happen? Yeah, I mean, on the weekend it happened because it was a weekend. I was completely on my own for that for those opening moments. But mm-hmm. by the time the week had properly started, we did get guidance that we, as an organisation, could call Hamas a terrorist mm-hmm. organisation because that is how the government calls them. That mm-hmm. is what they're officially called on the government website. Um, how I tended to write it was Hamas, which the government calls a terrorist organisation, just mm-hmm. to say this is what the government calls them and that's why we're doing it too. Yeah. There are so many other things we could talk about during during the year. From from a Christian perspective, one uh, fascinating story, if you like, was um, the journey of our friend Kate Forbes, um, who, of course, was the uh, the candidate, um, narrowly defeated candidate for the leadership of the Scottish, Scottish National Party. She would have been first minister had she uh, been elected. She lost by that perilous uh, margin of 52-48 on the uh, uh, on the final round to uh, Humza Yusuf. Obviously, her Christian faith was very much put under the spotlight. Um, was that a thing that you engage with much from your perspective? And how do you think, how how would you mediate that? How did you mediate that if that was the case? Yeah, I'd be interested to know what you think. It seems like her strategy of kind of getting everything out in the open early on seemed mm-hmm. to kind of work because from a news cycle perspective, 
the news does move on if there's nothing new. So if she's said everything she's got to say and received all the criticism she's got to receive, then, you know, there's no point running it anymore because it's not it's not new news. Uh, mm. So from that point of view, from a news point of view, it's probably quite a strategic idea. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think she handled it as as well as anybody ever has and far, far better than I did. And the thing to remember is that she dealt with these issues at the beginning of her leadership contest, not the mm -hmm. beginning of her leadership, um, uh, which is a thing that never really, uh, well, certainly not a thing I did. And I think, so A, it's honest, and B, as you say, it seems to make tactical sense. Now, she did lose, but of course, people knew that she was a person of evangelical Christian faith, a Bible-believing Christian. So I think the alternative to her going publicly early, like she did, would have been for it to have been dragged out of her um, and for her to look equivocal over the weeks that followed. So I suspect she would have lost, but by, but by more. So she's a young woman in her early 30s. Um, she narrowly lost. You could argue it's not a bad time to not be the leader of the SNP. Yeah. Uh, I might be very unfair there. Um, and if she, if, she, if she wants it, I'm sure it's not the last we've heard of her. I'm not sure if you'd agree. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, she could do anything she wants. We've both spoken to her. She's so incredibly clever um, and interesting. So I'm sure she could turn her hand to anything she wants to. And she's got years and years to do it if she does. But maybe she, maybe she'll come back. Maybe not in this electoral cycle, but maybe in the next one. So talking of people who've sort of made comebacks, uh, the Lord Cameron. <laughs> Uh, I mean, were you as surprised as me? Yeah, I mean, what I loved about that was that everyone was surprised. There wasn't yeah. a political journalist who said, oh, you know, we saw it coming. That's mm. what we were hearing down the grapevine. I mean, what was fun was um, the new, the confirmation that he had actually been chosen as the foreign secretary broke during my bulletin while I was literally on air. So <laughs> I started off saying, David Cameron's walked down Downing Street and here's a clip of someone saying, we're not sure why he's there during that clip. I saw Sky flash. He is now the foreign secretary. So he came off the back of the clip and said, that, that's just been confirmed. He is now the foreign secretary. So, I mean, a mad one. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Tactical move to move the party to, I don't know, a kind of centrist come to us position? Yeah. Or do people remember? I, I guess I've got, I mean, so the only criticism is foreign secretary is a really important role. They really ought to be in the House of Commons and held to account by elected members. Having said all that, um, I think two things. First of all, it does kind of um, uh, allow Rishi Sunak to say to his moderate wing, look, I've not completely lost it. I'm with the, I've not yeah. given in to the new Conservatives or the various right wing families that there are now within the Conservative Party. Um, and also, you know, he's a serious character and your foreign secretary after the prime minister is your most important a global diplomat and having somebody who is relatively speaking well respected now within Europe there might be a few people who rise a, raise a few eyebrows because of Brexit and all that went before it but nevertheless I think around the world Cameron is a respected character and I think when we're dealing with issues like Israel uh, Palestine when we're dealing with uh, Ukraine we're dealing with you know whoever uh, emerges in the US over the next year I think he's a serious person and and um, and and it not not to be sniffed at and you know liberal democrat lords I've been speaking to have been impressed by you know just the quality of the man at the dispatch box he's he's clearly a pro and and enjoys it do you think people have short-term memories though because it's like people have completely forgotten about austerity even with Jeremy Hunt and all the cuts to the NHS it's like new role memory wiped Honestly, I feel there is a lot of that. I also think that, I try not to be too much of a polemicist here, but I think that the centre of the Conservative Party has moved so far to the right that Cameron is now seen as some terrible lefty, which does, of course, wind up those people in, in, on the right of the Conservative Party who um, who may now be looking to somebody else who's clearly planning a comeback, and that is Mr Farage. Yeah. Uh, I, now, um, being in the jungle, my, my 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 rule is this: as if anybody cares, um, that a a kind of post ambitious or retired or retiring politician going into the jungle, I guess that's kind of all right. But for ITV to give a platform to someone who's clearly not finished uh, his career is a little bit kind of giving a an easy platform without criticism to somebody, and and. Um, but he clearly made a decision and it's worked for him so far. How do you know if someone's finished their career or not? Or not well, though? of course not. Exactly. We don't <laughs> know. But I mean, I, I think there's a sense that this was all part of a strategy for Farage not to move into a new career like Hancock and uh, and others, I think, perhaps thought, well, this is a way of me 
exposing myself in a different way to a new market, to a new potential profession. Whereas I think uh, Nigel Farage's job was to come across as a reasonable human being to lots of people who don't care about politics and then go back into the politics. I've got an idea, Tim. What about yeah. we start a TV programme with Christian MPs locked in a deserted church in Northern Ireland? You've got you, Fiona Bruce, Gary Streeter, <laughs> Andrew Salou, and we just see what happens. We film you for, you know, over the course of a Sunday. It may or may not, but over the course of a Sunday we could do, because I... I I am not significant enough to ever been asked on any of those sort of <laughs> A-less. I've been asked on Celebrity Dancing on Ice. Have and you? On the island with Bear Grylls, but they're kind of second-rate celebrity. Did you say no to both? Yeah, yeah. And I, Why? I said no to them because it's time out of doing your job. Um, yeah. And that's the main thing. But yeah, that's think, fair. I mean, Farage clearly has got a bit of a plan, hasn't he, going forward to, um, to now, I mean, we could easily see him as a Conservative MP or the leader of reform. What do you expect him to do next? Well, it's a, it's drift. I think I think he's got more of a chance, hasn't he? If the Conservatives lose at the next election and go into a, a kind of bigger split, mm. uh, they have the kind of Suella wing on one side with Farage joining them, and mm. they have the kind of uh, Rishi and the and the moderates, the One Nation caucus on the other side. But you can't see, I can't see Farage coming in under Sunak. A mucky business with Tim Farron. We're talking to Cara Bentley, newsreader, broadcaster from Times Radio Breakfast Show, uh, joining us to have a, a look back at 2023. So, I mean, the first kind of political tweet, um, or whatever we call it, what, what do you call it? Is it a post now under X? Anyway, but it's a tweet from Farage as he returned from the jungle, was all about immigration, unsurprisingly. Uh, immigration, obviously, is the is the issue of the day. We've been talking about Rwanda over the last few days. It's clearly going to rumble on into the new year. Why do you think immigration matters so much um, to politicians? Do you think it matters that much to the people? Oh, it's it's such a difficult one, isn't it? Because so the figures in from this June, I think it was 672,000 was the net migration figure. The number of people coming, minor of the number of people who, who left. And the year before that, it was about 745,000. So it's a lot of people and people are saying that's that's a record high. And no party is saying we want that figure to go up and up and up even the kind of most heartwarming, come and, you know, have jobs, we'll have your families here, are not saying we want that number to be 2 million or whatever that is. So they're all variations on the same theme, which is, you know, even Labour is saying migration needs to be controlled. Mm. I think, I mean, it's popular, isn't it, among that kind of uh, the right wing, the Conservative Party, know that to to sound tough makes them more popular or they think it makes them more popular so they they kind of go down that path and I think Labour in a really tricky position I think they actually just have no idea what to say because they don't know whether to sound heartwarming or strict yeah I think that the the way that I think Kirsten was trying to play it is to to try and steer clear of all the morality and uh and all the kind of you know touchy-feely stuff and instead just say this is a load of money being spent on something that won't work when you're looking at, at Rwanda. Um, I wonder whether maybe the problem is the Conservative Party believes that immigration is unpopular, as we've said, but also believes that it's kind of economically necessary. I mean, of the of the people who came into the UK last year, maybe five or six percent came through as asylum seekers. So what, 94, 95 percent? We kind of invited them here. They have come through a controlled immigration route. And I suppose the difficulty is that they perhaps think that if they really did tackle immigration, it would have a, a bad impact on the economy. So you keep talking about how bad it is and then you don't fix it. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, and health and social care was left out of the sectors which had to kind of cut their numbers of immigration and visas given out kind of thing. So they know that that's needed for the NHS, um, but they've also had, we had stats recently about the number of people hired on agency staff hired by the NHS where they could have just, you know, hired loads of staff in that time yeah. or trained nurses in that time. Um, so clearly there are sectors that need people Um I mean, it's a tricky one, Tim. What What's your position? Do you what do you put a cap on it, or do you have a moral position and you filter yeah, it through morals? I think if you put a cap on it, then you um, it's like putting a cap on the number of I don't know um, bottles of milk you'll sell to the market. You sell to what the market wants, um, and I think the the problem is that we you've got to separate out what we'll call emergency 
migration, mm. refugees or asylum seekers, th those who are cl claiming asylum, we don't know they're all refugees, that's a separate story, but most of them are, by the way. Um, and then the 94 or 5% that are that are coming through legal routes. And, and it's hard to say that you'd say no to any one of those because they're all coming to do jobs or they're students paying a vast amount of money and basically cross subsidising our kids going to school, going to uh, university and helping the universities to uh, balance their books. Um, and, and so, I mean, I represent obviously a big hospitality tourism area uh, and, you know, we've got, you know, more than the, about, about two thirds of our business is not able to meet the demand they've got because they haven't got the staff that they need. And this is part of it. So I try to be pragmatic about it um, when it comes to um, what should we say, normal regulation, uh, normal Im immigration. And then I get all um, bleeding heart liberal about refugees because I kind of think. <laughs> I do think Christians are absolutely entitled, um, looking at the Bible, to take totally different points of view as to how controlled or uncontrolled our borders are when it comes to regular migration, economic migration or what have you. But I kind of think the Bible is unequivocally clear about refugees. And um, although we do need to assess them um, to check they are. But, you know, I think our problem with the country at the moment, with the government at the moment, is they're not assessing those people and we don't know who is and who isn't and we're not removing the ones who aren't and we're not allowing the people who are to get on with their lives. And the backlog problem is a problem, isn't it? If you've got people, whether they are genuine asylum seekers or not, we kind of just need to know. And then you can you can deal with that however that party wants to deal with it. But having a backlog yeah. where people are either on Bibby Stockholm or in hotels and not able to work is not sustainable, clearly. And I think maybe immigration is an issue that probably doesn't directly touch the lives of the majority of the British people. But they might read about it, hear about it, see it and think they do or they don't like it. But obviously it is going to have an impact on the election. Um, but maybe not as much as the NHS, not as much as the cost of living. I don't know what we are. We're obviously now or not much more than we can't be more than 12 months away from the next election. Really it could be much sooner than that. So what do you, what do you think are going to be the deciding issues? I think immigration, uh, it is important to people, isn't it? Because people care about, they, they hear a message about the resources they've got, the NHS, the doctors they can't get hold of, their, their kids' school being, you know, big and lots of people. So I think whether or not they're right to make that connection, they do, um, even if immigration is not necessarily affecting their area. But I think it is some, something that some people do care about. However, I think whether you've got money in your pocket or not is ultimately you know, as we always say, kind of going to be the big thing. So if inflation does go down even further, if interest rates come down and people's mortgages are not so high, I I can see the Conservatives surviving and not being absolutely wiped out. Mm. Um, what Tim, what would you say to a, a Lib Lab pact? Would you accept a place in government again? I, I've always I've always said I've, I'm, I'm totally, I describe myself as post-ambitious, uh, which means it would be fine for me to go in the jungle, but I'm not going to. Um, but I I kind of think that I'd have to be offered something where I really think I could make a big, 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 big difference, like housing or something like that. Um, but I've otherwise no ambition whatsoever in, in that area. I my, my sense is, I don't know if you agree with me, that Labour will probably win the election um, mm. with a majority. Maybe not an absolute thumping one, because I think the yeah. SNP will lose seats, but not by, they'll not get wiped out. Yeah. Um, and I think that... Um, so I, I, I think the Liberal Democrats will be more important um, in the next parliament, but I don't think we're likely to form part of the administration. Um, is, is that because you don't think uh, you'll be asked or do you think you'd Lib Dems would, would reject it? Well, that's a great question. And I think I mean, I, I can say this as a kind of an outsider, as a former leader. You know, I, I, I would give us during the five years we were in coalition, as I've said before, eight out of 10 for the policy, for the detail, and two out of 10 for the politics, for how clever we were about how we presented everything. Um, and I think there's a sense in which um, we've got kind of burnt fingers. It doesn't mean we think we'll never want to be in power, but I suspect we would recognise as more we can achieve um, being influential, but on the opposition benches than going into any kind of arrangement. That's my um, ill-informed, uninformed um, uh, uh, prediction. So when do you think it's going to be? Yeah, good question. So it has to be called before mid-December, right? But it could be yeah. as late potentially as January, but no one wants to campaign over Christmas. Um, I'm sure you don't. <laughs> There's a 1% chance of that, I think. That's, yeah, right. <laughs> so 
what well, probably either May or autumn. I think, oh, it's tough, isn't it? it? I mean, if inflation, say if Rishi got good inflation figures for the next three months, mm. I reckon he could call it in May because you might get your older electorate out more in nicer weather before the winter comes. You don't have to campaign over the summer. You bring the election date back to May when it's always been. Um, and who knows what could happen if you wait even longer. Um, I don't know, when do you think? Um, I keep changing my mind as well. I, t- I tend to think it is more likely to go late than early. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think from a conservative point of view, there are lots of reasons to go in May. Um, yeah. And that is, but, it, but they tend to depend upon accepting that you're going to lose. And it's about making sure you don't lose catastrophically. So they have the local elections and the general election on the same day, 2nd of May. They will massively minimise the number of council losses they make because there'll be a seventy percent turnout rather than kind of thirty five percent turnout, and that means Conservatives will come out and some Tory mayors will hold their jobs, police commissioners, and a lot more councillors. Which means if they do lose the general election, it means their comeback from the wilderness might not take as long because they'll keep their infrastructure. But that all involves them accepting defeat. And I kind of I think if I was in their position, I'd find that hard to do psychologically. So you're bound to keep going to the bitter end, thinking something might turn up. I don't think they're going to wreck everybody's Christmases. <laughs> no, uh, no. Year. Um, I think the election will be you no know, later than December next year. Um, but I think it could be then and I think it could be October, November. So I'd I'd say, uh, let's say a 40 percent chance of the spring a 59% chance of the autumn and a 1% chance of that blooming Christmas, New Year, 24, 25 election. Don't totally write it off. <laughs> Imagine us all going out on Christmas Day. Yes. Going, to, going to the ballot box. Um, how does an election make you feel? Does it make you feel excited or nervous? Oh, both of those things. I mean, I think um, excited, and but then when it gets to the last few days, nervous. But you, you've just got to put all that off, really. And... Um, and I think that the, the one thing is not knowing exactly when it's going to be. So, you know, the, is, is, is 2024 for, you know, as a, as a person who's going to be a you know, candidate in the election, is it, a, is it a marathon or is it a sprint? And and the answer is it could be a marathon at sprint speed. <laughs> and you've just got to keep it up. So pretty much from the 2nd of January onwards, we're just in on, game face on and you keep going for as long as you have to. I, I mostly, no, I almost entirely enjoy it. Um, so um, I'm kind of looking forward to it and it's going to happen anyway, whether I look forward to it or not. And uh, what will be, will be God's got a plan for me, whether it's defeat or victory, it'll be a good thing. Um, well, I'm very excited because obviously when you're in news, this is as exciting as it gets. So um, thankfully, you know, we just get pretty, pretty excited. (laughs) Well, let's leave our excitement there. Uh, we have the excitement of the of the, uh, the festive season of Christmas coming up over the next few days uh, and weeks, which I hope you're going to have a, a, some kind of a break. Because I know the news never stops, but I hope, I hope you do. Yes. And actually, a lot of news does stop because also the world is not sending out press releases or coming outside their doorstep for comment. So there is less news. <laughs> well, we'll do our best not to send you too many press releases, at least for a week <laughs> or so. But uh, Cara, absolute joy to have you with us. Thanks ever so much. We've We've solved everything. The future is now so no, nobody needs to bother oh. listening to the news next year <laughs> now know what's going to happen so um, God bless you happy Christmas thank you Tim each week we give you the opportunity for you to ask any question you'd like about this mucky business of politics it may be how an aspect of this world impacts us Christians who work within it or maybe there's a particular issue that you're struggling to make sense of well I'd love to hear from you an attempt an answer at least so please drop me an email to farron at premier.org.uk. This week, John has been in touch and he says this. Is the House of Lords still fit for purpose? It seems that it's a wild west where anyone can be given a seat there, just like what happened with Mr Cameron, Lord Cameron now, of course. Then on the other hand, the Lords has got the power to block the plans of an elected government. Throw on top of that the bishops, who seem to be an extension of the Labour Party. Well, that's John's question. Let's have a see if we can come up with an answer. It's an interesting question. So first of all, is the, Lord, is the House of Lords still fit for purpose? What is its purpose? Well, these days, its purpose is basically to revise legislation and to scrutinise it. And to be fair, it does a better job of that than the House of Commons. In the House of Commons, you've got a government with a majority. People vote almost always on party lines. 
the whip is very, very heavy. In other words, MPs, particularly in the government, kind of have to do what they're told by the whips or face consequences, including not being selected again to stand for their party. And so it doesn't or legislation doesn't get the scrutiny that it really should do in the House of Commons. In the Lords, where people, well, they, they do hold a whip, most of them, but they tend to be lightly whipped because there's nothing you can really do to a Lord. You can't deselect them. Uh, it means that the scrutiny is better. Having said all that, there are eight or 900 Lords. There are probably only a couple hundred of them who actually really pull a shift. And so many of the people who are in there, as you say, John, are appointed for all sorts of reasons. They've do donated money to their parties. They've been friends or associates of a prime minister at one point or another, or they're there appointed by um, the, the monarch through the recommendation of another party leader. It's kind of no way to run a country. Having said that, if we didn't have a revising chamber, then the quality of our legislation would be worse than it currently is. I kind of think what helps in the Lords is the fact that the people who belong to it can't really be that easily controlled by their party because they don't face another election or any election. Having said that, the authority and legitimacy the House of Lords has is massively diminished because they weren't elected in the first place. And then on top of that, you've got the sniff of corruption, people might say, about people being appointed because of the donations they've made or whose friend they happen to be. So how do we deal with that? Well, the Tim Farron manifesto is this. It's not in any other parties. I would elect the House of Lords completely, but I'd elect them, maybe on five-year intervals, the Lords, each um, tranche of them, on a single 15-year term. So you would be elected, but you'd never be allowed to stand again, and you'd have a long period to be in there. As a result, you'd therefore have legitimacy, because you'd been elected, but you wouldn't be really all that beholden to the whips. You would be able to think and vote independently. There you are. Let's see if any other parties nick that for their manifesto. If you have a question for Tim, email farron at premier.org.uk. Well, let's close our time together in prayer. Uh, loving Heavenly Father, we lift up to you Israel and Gaza. We pray for peace. We pray for justice, that evil people, that terrorists would be brought to account, brought to justice and prevented from carrying out any more murderous activity. We pray, though, for wisdom and for peace in the hearts of all of the world's leaders. In particular, we pray for the leaders of Israel, that they would make wise and compassionate choices. We pray for an end to the suffering and the conflict there and for a lasting peace. We pray also for your protection of that small Christian community, um, many of whom we've been hearing from in recent days. Strengthen them and strengthen their faith in you and their witness um, to others and keep them safe and provided for. And Lord, we pray for our MPs, our leaders, our wannabe MPs, candidates looking at facing an election next year. We know that this time of year is a time when people of all kinds, especially politicians who are not Christians, are exposed to the gospel. At least they can be through carol services and other church and Christmas events. And we just pray for MPs of all political colours, leaders of all political colours, candidates of all political colours that they would hear the gospel preached faithfully this Christmas and that they would respond. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's show and for the whole of 2023. It's been a blessing to have you with us. We're going to be taking a break over the next few weeks over Christmas and the beginning of the new year, but we will be back later in January. In the meantime, don't forget that you can catch up on past episodes which feature interviews with party leaders, former government ministers and MPs from all the major parties. Just search for A Mucky Business on your chosen podcast provider or head to premier.plus forward slash A Mucky Business. Happy Christmas. See you soon.